So I'm very excited to be able to be here, first because it's Berkeley, uh, second because it's you know, uh, an interesting topic that is close to my heart, and that I have had the opportunity to start working only recently because I had this talk. If I hadn't had this talk, I probably would have even postponed it further in time. Uh, and, and the other reason why I'm excited is because it's almost some kind of anniversary celebration. So one year ago in Spain, we were witnessing one of the largest protests in our history and in European history. Um, so I had this kind of very nice video here, which doesn't work, which shows you know the different cities in Spain, all of the main capitals of the 50 provinces and many smaller villages, and the crowds that gathered the 8th of March uh, in 2018. So this, this was a kind of a unique event that has gathered my attention. I have been working on political protests for a while already, but not this kind of women protest. So this is what I'm going to be talking about. And um, let me start by saying that this is not this is not um, unusual in, in Spanish politics. So Spain is a country where protest is very common. So here on the left you have a graph showing the level of uh, participation in demonstrations in Europe. The red line is the average for Europe, that's 10%. And the blue line is the average for Spain, which goes up between 20 and 35%. You can see the peaks there around 2003 and 2011. Those peaks you may be interested in knowing. The first one is the Iraq War, which if you see this wonderful film now uh, on screen, Vice, uh, about how you know, this, this uh, uh, word was uh, cooked, um, you, will, you won't see that Spain was one of the, the few countries that supported Bush in going uh, to war to Iraq. And Spanish people were very much against this decision, and they went to the streets. And that, those were one of the most uh, crowded and attended demonstrations we've had in history. The other peak is the peak related to the Great Recession and the austerity policies and the real democracy now. You may remember the Indignados movement, which was the seat of the uh, Occupy movement that then traveled to the, to the US. So those peaks you know, have a history. And these are the data for the um, 8th of May, one year ago. I'm not going to go into any of the technical details of the data, so if anyone is interested, maybe I can talk about it in the Q&A, but I'll go more into, into the substance. So you see here that over 20% of people participated in these demonstrations. Uh, a little bit less, about 17%, went on strike that day, which was a general strike called and then uh, an even larger percentage ask other people to participate. And then everyone was talking about it. That's the last, uh, that's the last column. So th they were not, not uh, unexpected, this large protest, but still quite impressive. They mobilized the same number of people as all political topics during one year in, in Spain. Um, those months before March 2011 were not very um, quiet in Spain. You may recall we also had our Catalan uh, mess going on. So we had in uh, October 2017 uh, an, an illegal referendum, then a month later a unilateral declaration of independence. We really didn't know what was going to happen. I, I live in Barcelona, so it was it's really hard to convey the amount of uh, emotional intensity that we lived throughout those months. I mean, it was very, very intense and there was a lot of uncertainty, regardless of which side of a conflict you were in. Um, so the yellow line uh, shows uh, search in Google for one term random I chose. <laughs> it's the name of the president of Catalonia. And you can see that how it peaks around October and then it peaks later, the yellow line regarding uh, different events on his uh, runaway to Brussels. He's now in, in Brussels. You know that we are now having a political a, a trial of the uh, politicians that were involved in, the, in, the, in these events. Uh, the purple line is the line uh, of the search corresponding to the, uh, to the 8th of May protests. So it's really something that is gathering people's attention around the date. You won't see any uh, line regarding Me Too. That was not visible at that time. 
nor cuenta me it wasn't still there. The red, the red light, uh, line represents the 1st of May protests, which are like the typical uh, standard uh, uh, workers' uh, uh, demonstrations that take place every year. So this is just to highlight how important and how visible uh, this was uh, for people. What I'm going to try to do is to give you four arguments on why these protests happen. I usually work at the individual level, so I try to explain why people behave the way they do using surveys, but some of my arguments are going to be a bit more contextual. Uh, also for those of you that are not very familiar with the, with the Spanish case, and you're very welcome to raise your hand and interrupt me for any clarifications at any time in point. So I'm going to uh, handle four, four explanations that have to do with, or, or try to answer why now this protest and why some people chose to, to participate in them. The first one has to do with having an opportunity. So it's important to analyze how the political context provides incentives for people to actually engage into, into political action. And we are seeing a moment of political realignment that I think is consequential. The second has to do with how people see women issues. Uh, in general. So I'm going to talk a little bit about attitudes, uh, attitudes of stereotyping and sexism so that you have an idea of how you know, Spain locates in, in, in these in this questions. And then I'm going to talk about the Me Too as an element that brings to uh, um, um, resources that are important for participation. One is plain mobilization via social media, so we know that people participate because, it, because they are asked to participate, among other reasons. And the other one is the collective identity that is necessary for protests to, uh, to build up and gain momentum. And then finally, I'm going to also highlight the relevance of the spark or the trigger that generates the moral outrage that is also a very powerful political, uh, political motivation. If I have time, I will try to work a bit or to um, share with you a bit my analysis on what have been the consequences of these protests. So I will have a look at how feminist collective identity has changed for the people that participated into these uh, protests and how this participation has also affected vote, vote intention, which is you know, the political relevance that this process will have eventually in the, in the electoral um, arena. Uh, and I will close with a reflection on the mobilization of anti-feminism, which is links with my previous topic, which is, uh, which is populism. Um, so let me start with a, an explanation that has to do with the context in Spain. So in Spain, for the, since the early 80s until 2014, we've had two main parties the left-wing party, the right-wing party, the socialist party, and the popular party. These are the blue lines and the red lines. This is vote intention. And you see that for a chunk, a long chunk, we only have the blue one there and the red. We have other things going on, but the, you know, the main logic of the system was this one. And then something happens in 2014 uh, when two new parties appear. So we have a new center-right party, Ciudadanos, that uh, is born basically around the Catalan question. So it's a Spanish nationalist liberal party, liberal in the European sense, so pro-market. Um, and then you have Podemos, which is a left-wing populist party, uh, moving from more populist to more left-wing and you know, still finding its, uh, its way. So this is a, a moment of clear political realignment. And it is you know, one of the arguments about why women uh, protest and why women get mobilized coming from Lisa Valdez on her work on Chile is that when there is a moment of political realignment, this is a condition that facilitates uh, protests and in particular women, women protests. So that's the first, uh, that's the first element to, uh, to, um, to bear in mind. Parties are still learning to handle the women question in Spain. So the Socialist Party is the party with the largest trajectory of defending women's rights, and they have enforced legislation against gender violence and pro-equality in 2004 and 2007, respectively. The Popular Party kind of tags along reluctantly. Uh, he buys the gender violence question. He's more uh, against quotas, for instance. 
Podemos is clearly a party that defines itself as a feminist party, and Ciudadanos is in the middle of the mess, as we are, as we are going to, to see. They, they, they struggle to find a, a position on the, on the question. So the second element has to do with predispositions. So this is an index of stereotyping coming from European data. The interesting point to see is not to follow all the numbers or anything. The interesting point to see is that Spain is at the tail of this index, near Sweden, <coughs> Denmark, and the Netherlands, with the lowest levels of stereotyping. This is asking people whether they think men are allowed to cry, whether women are more capable of caring, mm -hmm. and these kinds of, of things. And in, in the other extreme of the scale, you have some uh, Eastern European but Spain is a country with relatively low levels comparatively of stereotyping and usually in all indicators regarding attitudes towards gender equality we're quite there with the northern uh, European guys which we aren't usually with the northern European guys with uh, you know on, on other sorts of, uh, of elements. Um, now we looked a little bit more closely to what people thought uh, about women discrimination, about protests around women discrimination, and about policies to fight women discrimination. It turns out this is actually the definition of what is called modern sexism. So people don't go around anymore saying men are superior to women. People display sexist attitudes in a different uh, version, which is this modern version, by denying discrimination, by denying the legitimacy of protest because of this discrimination and the need for laws to correct for this discrimination. So we check that, and again here the important thing is not the overall number, but this index could go, this is basically the, people, the percentage of people that agree with these statements that in, uh, indicate modern sexism, and the, the range is zero to 100. So we'll go to the other room, uh, if we you know, go to the maximum level of uh, of uh, sexism, which, you know, it's encouraging, um, but still, we have this 10, 15 percent, sometimes for some indicators, 30 percent people that, you know, are not really that uh, um, uh, convinced that we have a problem with uh, women, women equality. But in general, I think part of the reason why the 8th of March was so powerful in Spain is because people are convinced in Spain that we have a problem about gender equality. Probably related to this is the visibility of uh, gender violence, because this is counted, this is recorded, and we have approximately one death a week of a woman killed by her partner or former partner. So, uh, you know, this is visible and people are aware of this. When it comes to other areas of discrimination, people are not that convinced that we have a problem. But at least in terms of sexual violence, we, we do have gender violence, we do have some recognition. So this was the second element I wanted to, uh, to point out. Um, the third element, the mobilization element. As I, as I said in the introduction, I think there are two ways in which the Me Too was important. So the Me Too uh, started, as you know, in October 2017, and in Spain it was particularly visible when it turned into Cuéntalo, which is the Spanish hashtag, the, kind of the way it was translated, and which uh, generated uh, a very large amount of uh, of traffic in, in, in Twitter. You can have a look at the web, there is a project of Proyecto Cuéntalo where you can see uh, in this area, around the area here, full of small dots, this is all the tweets that were uh, tweeted with this hashtag. And each tweet is, is coded according to a number of uh, characteristics. Uh, you can see whether the tweet is reporting a personal situation or whether it's talking about someone else or whether it's just a support for uh, uh, these questions or whether it's somebody against or trolling or whatever. So it's, it's quite impressive to see uh, uh, the number of, of, of tweets that were, that were issued around, around you know, during, during those months uh, starting in, in April 20th. But this was after the protests, 
okay? So I think we are going to see after that um, Me Too was known to people, the fact of knowing Me Too was relevant for participation to people, uh, but it became uh, even more so after the protest. So there is an element here of uh, mutual relationship between how the collective identity that Me Too uh, uh, produced in the sense of making personal experience become shared experiences and therefore able to be politically mobilized and how this uh, uh, generated protest and then how protest reinforced this uh, collective identity by generating even more a uh, movement. So these are the two elements I'll try to tap on at the individual level, how social media is a mobilization tool, but also uh, a tool to build uh, collective, collective identities that are essential for, for collective action. And finally, the moral, the moral outrage trigger. So um, those of you familiar with um, Spanish politics will remember that in November 2017, we had the trial of these five men uh, that were accused of a gang rape, uh, of gang raping an 18-year-old in, in the San Fermín is two years, one year before, one year and a half before. Uh, and maybe you didn't notice uh, in the graph before, but there was this gray line there that I didn't talk about. Uh, the gray line peaks in November when the trial is being held. The gray, the gray line is the search for La Manada. La Manada was the self-given name to this group. That's the herd or the pack in, in, in English. I, I'm not sure the term conveys the kind of sound it has in, in, in Spanish, like very animal. Um, and then back again after the protests, in, in April when uh, the court uh, pronounced the sentence. And they were convicted, but not for the most uh, severe felony, and they were released on bail. So uh, obviously, you know, the, the, the kind of moral outrage generated, this is not a direct assessment of the moral outrage generated by this case, but it's, it's an indicator of how people, how interested people were in this, in this topic. And we also have information about whether people knew about this about this case. Okay, um, so um, about 70% of people knew uh, this case I was mentioning. Um, we ask whether they think the case is a case of, and we give several incorrect answers, and the correct answer, uh, more people that knew about Me Too. So this is about 70%, this is about 50%, still is about 50% of our sample aware of a hashtag in English in Spain. So it's not, it's not irrelevant. And then we also tapped into um, um, the knowledge of two um, uh, active uh, uh, people uh, in Twitter and socially in general. So Barbie is a journalist who has a blog uh, specialized in uh, gender questions. And she has a very strong feminist uh, stand. And she has about 300,000 followers in Twitter. So she's very well followed. Still only if less than 30% of people know who uh, Barbie is. And then we have Leticia Dolera, who is an actress. She's a celebrity, the closest kind of example we have to a celebrity, also very much engaged into uh, feminism. She's followed by uh, about 170,000 people in Twitter, and she uh, is very active, and she is better known. You know, so yeah, the word doesn't happen in Twitter. I know I'm... I'm, not, I'm challenging you with this, uh, with this uh, table, but this is just a summary and I want to walk you through it. Uh, so what I am trying to see here is how important were all these elements in explaining why people decided to participate in this protest. So I am taking participation in a broad sense, so I'm considering people that went on strike, uh, went to the demonstration, or mobilized somebody to participate in the demonstration or the protests. Um, 
I am uh, considering a number of factors which are all listed here. It's kind of unpleasant. And then uh, what I basically will see if, is whether the effect of these variables was zero, whether they didn't matter. Okay. If they are to the right of the zero and very far away, it means that they matter a lot. The more this characteristic, the more they were to, more likely they were to participate. If it goes to the left, the more this characteristic, the less they were to participate. Okay? So we have, starting from top, some social demographics. We have more women than men in the protest. Okay? If you are a man, you were less likely to participate. So the dot is on the left. Okay. And we also have more young people than people middle-aged or older. Our sample is not representative in terms of age. We don't have older people in our sample. Okay. But people from <coughs> 16 to 29 were more likely to participate in this protest. That's not surprising. It's a little bit more surprising that we don't find an effect of education or income. This means that protests were very transversal socially. And this is actually something that challenges what people tend to say sometimes, that feminism is something elitist, that only you know, intellectuals and people with uh, higher levels of education and resources um, uh, support. That's, that's not what the data are saying. The data are saying that people from all uh, ed educational and economic backgrounds were participating. Again, with some caveats on the representativeness of, of the sample, but the, the, the data are actually better for this kind of analysis than for just assessing how many people went to or did that. Right. Now, the predisposition. So you actually participate in protests because you feel, you think that you know what the protests are after, what they defend is something that is meaningful to you, you believe in that, and you want to do something to achieve that. So this is what we measure by uh, sexism and self-ideological location. And these are the most powerful predictors. So people that score high on this modern sexism index are far less likely to participate. People that score <laughs> high in the left-right scale means people that are to the right, that consider themselves as conservatives, they are far less likely to participate. Okay, these are the most important predictors. Consider yourself a feminist, not so important for deciding you to go to the demonstration. We will see that there are consequences on your degree of identification as a feminist, but it's not an explanation. It's not a very relevant explanation. And then being a Twitter user is uh, uh, becoming, I should say, a Twitter user is an explanatory factor. So people that became Twitter users during 2018, between May 2017 and May 2018, were more likely to participate. We don't see a Facebook effect. So it didn't go through Facebook, it went through <coughs> Twitter, as you know, the Me Too would, uh, would suggest. Knowing about La Manada, Me Too, Barbie, uh, Dolera also matters. So if you are more knowledgeable of all these feminist related questions, you are more likely to participate. But we don't know to what extent this is a cause or an effect in this case because we didn't measure this before. Um, and then there are also some biographical um, elements that can explain you being more likely to participate. For instance, if you had a daughter, in the last year, doesn't matter whether you are a man or a woman, you were more likely to participate. Or if you were caring for somebody older, old, uh, you were also more likely to participate. If this is smaller, but there is some elements that have to do with your personal biography that are uh, also significant. So in short, quite transversal in terms of social demographics regarding education and income, more women, more young people, and the most uh, important predictor is how you feel about discrimination and how you locate yourself in terms of the left-right scale. Uh, social media are important too. So th this effect of Twitter is actually quite, uh, quite large. You can increase your probability of, uh, of participating by, by over 30 percentage points, which is a, it's a big effect. Um, but this is becoming a a user, so not many people become a user in this in this time time frame. Okay, so a couple of words about the consequences. 
So we are interested in knowing to what extent people consider themselves feminists. So um, we offered in our survey, which was asked before the demonstrations and after the demonstrations, uh, to what extent they do so in a scale from zero to 10, where zero is not at all feminist and 10 is completely feminist. And we have this distribution where most people uh, locate themselves in the five, uh, which can be interpreted in a number of ways, like people not being familiar with this kind of uh, dimension, people not very, being very clear about what feminism exactly means, uh, uh, people finding attractive in general the five in a, in a scale from zero to five. So there are many reasons why this is there. What is interesting here is that the distribution changes a little bit, you know, between May 2017, before the protest, and May 2018. Everyone moves a little bit, not everyone, sorry, but, you know, the percentages move a little bit to the right. So people consider themselves more feminists than they did the year previously. Uh, so there is less people in the five and more people in the higher levels of the, of the scale. Of course, this can be due to many different things. It may not be the protests. It may be only La Manada or it may be only, I don't know, the Catalan referendum because all these things happen between the two waves, okay? So we have a closer look and we say, okay, those that went to the protest, did they change in their feminist identity? And the data support this. So those that did not participate in the protest have a smaller change in feminism between the two waves than those that went in the protest. We all moved a little bit towards the more feminist position, but those that went to the protest moved significantly more. Okay? The other thing we look at is if this participation in protest changes your intention to vote for a party. For instance, are people more likely to vote for Podemos because Podemos is, you know, flagging the feminist uh, argument or more likely to vote for the socialists because the socialists are, you know, have a clear uh, trajectory in promoting uh, gender equality, less likely to vote for PP, the conservatives, the traditional mainstream conservatives, less people are more like, sorry, more likely or less likely to vote for Ciudadanos. And the only, a party for which we find an effect is this, uh, this later party, Ciudadanos. So it's not that going to the protest reduces the chances of voting for this party, uh, but we are all a little bit more feminist in 2018 as compared to 2017 in Spain, but we are also a little bit more likely to vote for Ciudadanos, except if you went to the protests. So the protest keep the intention to vote for this party stable, right? Um, we will see what happens because nobody in, in this, you know, in the coming days we're gonna have again uh, demonstrations in Spain and parties need to locate themselves and say, okay, so shall we go to the protest or shall we not go to the protest? So Ciudadanos is in this uneasy position because they, um, they, they wanna, uh, portray that they are a party that is pro-equality, but they have, on the other hand, some political arguments that are very challenged by feminists, and on the other hand, this kind of not truly positive return out of uh, participating in the, in the protest. So we see how they deal with it. And then the last, uh, the last argument I wanted to, uh, to make, so, Usually a wave of feminist mobilization like this one comes with a wave of anti-feminist mobilization afterwards, the backlash reaction. And here we see, you know, this is, this is very much related but in a kind of complex way with the back, populist backlash reaction in general. So in the case of the US, it's very clear that populism is connected to an anti women um, idea or sexism is very present in the kind of populist discourse that you see, particularly in, the, in Donald Trump. But this is not always the case in all, uh, in all uh, populist radical uh, right parties. So for instance, uh, in the UK, the UKIP is basically 
quite silent about the issues, not very relevant. And some uh, uh, populist parties in Northern Europe, they actually engage in a pro-feminist discourse that some could call a violet uh, shower or, you know, it's basically the idea of using uh, feminist arguments and the promotion of equality between, between men and women as a way to discredit or oppose migrants and in particular Muslim uh, migrants. So it, it's a kind of complicated relationship. What do we have in Spain? So we have two things. So this, this guy on the top corner, he's the new leader of the uh, popular party, so the conservative party, so many things have happened in Spain in this past year and one of the things that happened is that the conservative party, the popular party government was thrown out uh, of office by a vote of no confidence. This was uh, just before our second wave, uh, so in May 2018. So he was not former prime minister, so he was elected after former prime minister was left <coughs> office by a process of internal primaries. It was the first time that there were internal primaries in Spain, the Conservative Party, in the Popular Party, and he sort of handles the most extreme position in all issues. I would say economic policy, the Catalan question, which is a fundamental question in political conflict in Spain now, and a uh, women's uh, question. So we started by a move towards more conservative positions of the uh, traditional mainstream right. And we followed by, because we were the, like the nice uh, European exception, we didn't have a radical right party in, in our institutions. We were fantastic and nobody else did and we did. And then suddenly we had a regional election in uh, November in, in Andalusia this year in 20, I mean last year in 2018 and the radical right party which you know I, I don't think they are even populist I mean they are just uh, a reactionary party won 12 sweet, sweet seats and we are expecting in the new elections in April um, you know that they will get representation in, in some of the largest districts in, in Spain so this is um, typical uh, right-wing party, extreme right-wing party, particularly focusing on the Catalan question, so it's a Spanish unity and Spanish nationalism at the highest level of intensity, but the second topic is feminism. It's not migrants. Migrants is the third. So they are very strongly against uh, any kind of law, even the uh, gender violence laws that are heavily supported by public opinion and all other parties. Uh, and we'll see how we deal with that, but uh, this is now part of the picture. This is where this connects to my previous research and I will see how sense uh, I can make out of all of this. I'm really looking forward to uh, your questions and comments. Thank you very much.